Good evening. I'm Bill Seymour from the Harvard Kennedy School New England Alumni Association. On behalf of my group and the Shorenstein Center for Media, Politics, and Public Policy, I would like to welcome you to our webinar, Covering American Politics, Does the Old Shoe Still Fit? I'd like to thank our panelists and our moderator for generously donating their time to discuss this important topic tonight. I'd also like to thank the Harvard alumni and others from the public for attending, and my colleagues at the Shorenstein Center for their collaboration on this event. I'd like to introduce our president of our association, Theodore Skadias, for a few words. Thanks so much, Bell. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Theodore Skadis, and I'm the president of the HKS New England Alumni Association. We are really excited to be here with you for this very exciting conversation, um, which is taking place in just a larger conversation that we are having about this issue uh, amidst the... Was oh, there a bit of background? I don't know if that's me or not, but... Bill, I think maybe if you mute yourself, it might help. Okay, I think we're all set. Um, so super excited to be here with everybody, and um, and thank you all so much for for taking your time out of out of your busy schedules to have this conversation. Uh, I'm going to pass it on to Brian, who is our MC for the evening. So Brian, take it away. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you so much. We've got lots of folks coming in here. We just uh, we're we're uh, seeing lots of attendees coming in. So as you're coming in, uh, I'll introduce our panelists, and we'll get right to the conversation. Uh, we promise we're going to disagree and debate about these issues about the future of American political journalism. Up first, Kathy Keeley, a veteran of outlets like USA Today, the New York Daily News, and CBS News. Uh, she's the Lee Hills Chair in Free Press Studies at the Missouri School of Journalism. Uh, Major Garrett, the Chief Washington Correspondent for CBS News. He's also the host of the Takeout Podcast. Right now, he's out promoting his new book, uh, The Big Truth, Upholding Democracy in the Age of the Big Lie. Uh, and uh, Tom Patterson, the Bradley Professor of Government and the Press at the Harvard Kennedy School. Many of you know him very well. Uh, his, his books uh, in the past, I think, sum up, uh, you know, if we look at three of the titles uh, fr from you, uh, uh, you know, it, it puts it in perspective. Informing the News, another one, Is the Republican Party Destroying Itself? And How America Lost Its Mind? And I, I think those, those three themes will come through uh, as we uh, discuss here tonight. Uh, I'm here because I'm the Walter Shorenstein Fellow at uh, the Shorenstein Center right now. Uh, I have been uh, having a blast uh, both in the fall and now in the spring. Um, and now that uh, I'm free of CNN, free of reliable sources, I did bring my uh, my reliable sources daily mug since that show was canceled after only a few weeks on CNN Plus. Uh, so that's my tribute to CNN. This hopefully will be a free uh, rolling discussion among all of us about the future of American political journalism. And uh, I brought some props. I brought some shoes. The question is whether the old shoe still fits and none of these shoes do. Let's start with all three of our panelists on what's wrong with the old shoes. What's broken about the current state of American political journalism? Kathy, do you wanna start us off? Well, I, you know, I think um, there's a lot to, that, are, that is wrong and we've talked a lot about over coverage of horse race, but that is really not the current problem. The current problem uh, is that we've spent our, most of us who are of a certain age have spent our careers operating by a certain set of norms. Um, and they were pretty good norms. Uh, you know, I really had some great experiences as a journalist, being able to talk to people on many sides of many issues uh, because uh, we maintained this stance of neutrality. And um, it was a literary pose, but it was a very effective literary prose, a pose. And the idea was that you would give everybody a fair shake. Um, the problem is, that when we are, we are operating by those norms under the assumption that the people we cover are also operating by certain norms, like you tell the truth, um, you don't endanger the country that we all live in, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, maybe uh, Tom could fill in some of those blanks, but the dilemma we have now is how do you act and what do you do as a journalist when the people you cover, some of them, are not operating by the norms that made the whole system work? 
Tom, is that the accurate diagnosis of the problem? Are there other problems to add? Well, I certainly agree with uh, Kathy's basic premise. So, um, you know, under the old model, uh, you know, you quoted newsmakers. And, uh, but when you have an unchecked deceptive claim uh, paired with a, a truthful claim, uh, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, then you're leaving it to the audience uh, to decide where the truth lies. And uh, we now have lots of studies about uh, the importance of confirmation bias and that uh, people are going to accept uh, what was claimed uh, if it fits what they believe or what they would like to believe. So uh, on the other hand, uh, it's kind of a no-win situation for journalists too when they uh, call out uh, one one side or the other. Uh, again, it's because of this confirmation bias. The uh, audiences begin to argue back and say, uh, it, it isn't my person that's lying. It's the it's the journalist that that's slanting this, that's twisting it, uh, and that can undermine uh, trust in the press. So um, this is a real dilemma. This is a very hard uh, uh, landscape and uh, for journalists to navigate. And uh, I, I don't think we have quite yet figured out uh, how to do that and do that properly without uh, kind of undermining the standing of the press and yet. Uh, fulfilling the responsibility of the press to inform their audiences. Major, you have to do it every day. Yes, let's talk about power. Power is the center of this conversation. And Brian, I love you showing up those different shoes. Oh, I've got all 30 or 40 years ago, 30 or 40 years ago, when you had dominant American newspapers and dominant network newscasts, reaching more than half of the households in this country every single night, the shoe that wore was worn by national political journalists was a big boot, big, thick, reinforced sole, big steel toe. And politicians knew that the audience trusted those journalists. There was a market share that was enormous and the power behind the questions asked and the answers written down and conveyed to an audience was real. And politicians feared the power invested in that market share and in that credibility. This is a power dynamic question as much as it is anything, because the power of the mass media is so diluted now as compared to where it was 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, that politicians no longer fear that. So they operate on their own system of incentive structures, mm. which skips around or completely ignores that power that used to be in our possession, that big boot that we used to have. If they stomped our foot, we didn't feel it. And if we kicked them in the shin, they did. We basically have a house slipper, if we're lucky now, metaphorically, a house slipper, because our industry has been under financial stress for 20 years. One of my dearest friends in journalism is Mark Russell. He's the first African-American editor of the Memphis Commercial Appeal. Before he had that job, he was at the Orlando Sentinel. He was there for five years. And in those five years, you know what he did? He laid off 40% of his staff. And when you're a journalist working for a large newspaper in Florida or Texas, where Kathy and I first met, or California, and your newspaper is shrinking before your very eyes, and your very livelihood is a day-to-day -day question in your mind, and it is for your editor, and the copy editors have all disappeared, how psychologically aggressive are you going to be with your mayor, your councilman? your state legislator, et cetera, et cetera. The other this, is a power, this is a power question. And the power has been diluted for us. And we are struggling to maintain our place in the conversation, not to dominate it, not to sort of be the enforcer mm -hmm. of the standards that Kathy just talked about, but to just be part of the, the conversation and the incentive structures right. for politicians now allow them to stand athwart of the power that they used to be afraid of 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. Yeah, the, the other aspect of um, that economic problem that um, Major so- For example, uh, Kathy used to head up Washington bureaus uh, for papers that don't have them anymore. Yes. Oh, is there a delay? Do we get stuck on the delay? I'm sorry, Kathy. I'm gonna- No, that's exactly right. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm a two-time member of the Dead Newspaper Society. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, 
that problem, the more insidious part of that problem, because I think most journalists are still pretty tough and dedicated to their craft. But the more insidious part of the financial problem that Major outlined is that it pushes publishers and editors to go for clickbait over public service journalism. Because we know now exactly how many people are looking at each story at any given moment. And you know, back in the old days, we used to kind of understand that the celebrity divorce story was going to get more eyeballs than the state Senate subcommittee on secondary education budgets. But we would put both stories in the paper. Now, the celebrity divorce story would be on page one, but it would be under the fold, you know, because and the the secondary education budget might be back there a ways. But now I think the diminishment of newsroom personnel added with what we know about, you know, I, I like to call this the Pogo problem, if anybody remembers the comic strip Pogo and that great um, a panel where Pogo is looking in the mirror and the caption is, we have met the enemy and it is us. I mean, we're clicking on the intellectual equivalent of junk food and it is causing commercial enterprises, which are news organizations, to give us more. Uh, Brian, can I jump in a little bit Please and follow up on the, the point that Kathy made? Um, uh, this is an old problem of journalism, but uh, I think it's uh, compounded by uh, what Kathy's talking about and also the speed uh, with which uh, the kind of the news cycle churns and, and the need to get out there very quickly. Uh, and I think a good example of some of the flaws that appear when, because of, of, of those kinds of pressures, uh, I've, I think the coverage of the classified documents is abysmal on several levels. Uh, one, uh, you know, all the issues that could dominate the news for a full month, we've got some real problems in this country, uh, inflation, immigration, and you can go down the list. Uh, well, what's the top issue? Classified documents. But uh, most of the people who are reporting on this know very little about the classification system uh, or how this might happen. Uh, there's almost an implicit assumption as well that uh, these three individuals pack their own boxes when they when they leave when they leave office. This is a staff function uh, to kind of do that screening and the like. So uh, I just think there's been uh, kind of outlandish uh, claims made. Uh, there, there's not enough kind of information in some ways and. Part of this goes, if you got to get out there quickly, uh, then that framing kind of takes over the story. Uh, one of the other pressures that comes with what was Kathy was talking about, the economic pressure, uh, you kind of, not only do you cut your, your newsroom, and that takes out some of the expertise, but oftentimes you cut out the more senior people, uh, yes. uh, the ones that know more, uh, and replace them with uh, younger and less expensive reporters. Uh, this all compounds the problem of, do journalists know enough? Uh, to really report some of this accurately. And when they don't, they become part of the misinformation problem. Mm. And Brian, if I could jump in. When I broke into the newspaper business in 1984 and was in the newspaper or print magazine business for 17 years, the most aggressive schedule I ever had to work on was two deadlines a day. If you're a digital journalist now, you have 10 deadlines in your first four hours. And anyone who is familiar with news consumption on any portable device knows people constantly refresh their phone to see what is new. There is a market demand for newness. But newness leaves scarce time for deeper reporting, to Kathy's earlier point. And then you have the entire ecosystem around traditional journalism, and we have a headline today. What happened today? Meta has replatformed former President Trump, okay? That's now part of an ecosystem in which Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram are news venues for a vast number of consumers, much larger than the consumers who watch the CBS Evening News or who watch NBC Nightly News, or who watch ABC World's News Tonight, or who watch CNN, or MS, or Fox. 
that's also part of this ecosystem. And that goes back to one of my original observations that yes, I, I look, I believe in the standard old style, basic forms of journalism, ask and answer, record, let the audience figure it out for themselves. Although I just wrote a book and you were kind enough to mention it about the big lie. That's not a contestable issue. That's a knowable fact. And to call it a lie is a basically not even a courageous demonstration of truth. It's well, just simple, basic about. facts. Yes. <laughs> now, know, the, 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 there was those, a those, those, people were ashamed say, of telling a lie. Yes. You, they, were, they were ashamed of telling a lie. And because <laughs> of the superstructure around the diminished role of journalism, they can. And Meta, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok are all venues by which all of this can create a velocity that far outstrips our ability to chase it down or correct it or even be remembered that we did correct it. But as Michael Jordan famously said, you miss every shot you don't take. So we've got to keep taking all our shots. Let, let me add to that, Major, your point about Meta's announcement today about Trump. What I noticed, so it was embargoed till 5 p.m. Eastern time. And it went, you know, and it half a dozen news sites broke it at, at 5 p.m. Eastern. What I noticed was that by 5.15 Eastern, there were all these Insta reactions, uh, an analysis pieces telling you it's terrible, commentary is telling you it's great reactions from ag advocacy groups. Right. So all of the steps that usually would have that would have taken a day or two back in the mm -hmm. past now happen in 15 minutes. And yes. there's this instant processing. It's like the, the food is digested and mm -hmm. sent back out within 15 minutes. And in that environment, it's overwhelming for consumers. So overwhelming, I wonder completely overwhelming. Is the problem is the problem, the journalism that's being produced, or is the problem everything that surrounds the journalism, including the lies on cable news and the rants on Twitter? And maybe the answer is a mix of both. But, you know, I think we have to somehow differentiate between that. Well, I think we're living in a bubble. Just as much as anybody, you know, we know from uh, the Facebook papers that, you um, that algorithms on social media are driving people to extremes and in the bubble. We too, we journalists live in a bubble, okay? And I'm gonna give you an example. I went with the people um, who, I live in Columbia, Missouri, halfway between St. Louis and Kansas City. I, I made a very intentional move. I self-deported from Washington. And I went with some of our radio uh, people from KBIA, our, our public NPR station that we own and operate, we went to a little town called Moberly. It's in a county that just north of here that voted something like 75% for Trump. Meanwhile, the Columbia School of Journalism went to Flatbush, Brooklyn. And the idea was we were going to have these town hall meetings and let people kind of talk to each other and see, are these communities really as different from each other as we think. And the radio news director and I were absolutely adamant that we were not going to set the table. We were not gonna ask people about the issues that were the news of the day. We were going to let them tell us what was important. And do you know what? In Brooklyn, New York, and in Moberly, Missouri, housing is what's important, the housing crisis. How many stories have you seen about the housing crisis? We're setting the agenda. We're letting the big story of the day, the clickbait story of the day, set the determine because we know Trump is going to get clicks. Mm -hmm. And so we just have to, but covering the housing story costs money yep. and takes resources that, to Major's point, very few news organizations have anymore. So we are working at these journalism schools to try to figure out, I mean, we have students covering the state legislature now and they're working with experienced reporters, but at least people in Missouri are getting news about what their state legislators are doing. So we really have to start thinking outside the box. Like Major said, we've got to take our shots and find ways to fill the gap in the information safety net. But it is hard. And this is, this is not just a problem for journalists. This is a problem for civil society. We really have to start thinking about how are we gonna pay for public interest journalism? So I don't wanna to talk too much about specific yeah, cool. research studies, but I, I would like to bring one in. It's kind of a, 
the clickbait story and uh, and journalism. Um, so it is true uh, that Donald Trump now can tweet again and, and he's going to be back on Facebook and the like. And uh, we talk so much about uh, the corrupting influence of, of social media and uh, these things going viral and the like. There was a really interesting study that was done about where people, when Donald Trump was president, where they were getting information about that those tweets. How did they find out about those tweets? Uh, now, the Washington Post reported he sent out 25,000 uh, when he was president. You'd think presidents would have more things to do than to be sitting around tweeting all day, but uh, he did. Uh, but who was really paying attention to those tweets? Uh, the journalists were paying attention. Uh, and what this study found was that uh, more than 95% of Americans, uh, when they found out about a tweet, uh, found out about it through their, their news source, <laughs> not because of his Twitter feed, not because of a friend giving it to them. Of course, then uh, when they picked it up on the news story, then it became viral, then it went through social media. So. Uh, I think that's the answer to your question, Brian. Uh, I think both. <laughs> we have a we have a problem in the uh, in the ecosystem, and 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 there are also some problems in journalism. But Tom, but doesn't, Brian, doesn't, doesn't but Brian, liar, Brian, just go ahead, Major. No, no, it's, I'd rather hear Brian. Major. You know this as well as I do, because you were at CNN observing this, and I covered the first two and a half years of the Trump White House, and I covered the entire two years of the Trump campaign when he became president on that very first day. And Sean Spicer said, "A tweet is a presidential statement." What are you going to do? You have to report it. You are duty bound to report a presidential statement, even if no one in that building, and trust me, this happened to me more than once, could explain what it meant. <laughs> Look, I, I, I only use the shoe one more time, but the shoe doesn't fit anymore because lying has been successfully normalized. Not, not fibby, not, not only talking mm -hmm. about left and on, ignoring right, but actually lying has been normalized on a scale that reporters have never had to deal with in politics. Right. Maybe it happened in other fields, but not politics. And I think the George Santos story is one we should all talk about because I, I know newsrooms are struggling. I was in a newsroom yesterday yes. and the debate was happening between a bunch of staffers. Should we say he's a lying congressman or should we say he's a controversial congressman? I thought that was interesting because controversial could be a good thing, right? Controversial is kind con Yeah. The fact he's, he's a serial liar, but that debate's happening. And then a few hours later, the head of another newsroom says to me, should we be covering Santos so much? So Major, are you wrestling with that? You know, how to how much to cover um, this really aberrant figure who doesn't have a lot of power, but who seems newsworthy? So we have a standards department at CBS News. Uh, every network does. CNN has a standards department. Uh, our phraseology currently is exaggerations and embellishments. We don't call him a liar. We say he is exaggerated and embellished. And we are using all the legal terminology from the investigative agencies to describe what they're doing about George Santos. Uh, but we had a whole conversation internally about that very question. What do you call it? And what is the function of that declaration? What are you telling your audience? What are you trying to communicate? And what are you trying to avoid? One small digression. I believe controversial is the most overused, useless word in American journalism. If I could bury, well, two words, two words, unprecedented and controversial. But, but if I had to pick between them, I would bury controversial. The audience will figure out itself if it's controversial. Tell people what the debate is, they'll decide if it's a controversy. It's a lazy, lazy, intellectually vapid word. Um, <laughs> George Santos should be covered because. He ran for Congress, not only on these exaggerations and embellishments, but now it is becoming abundantly clear with money we don't even know the source of. Right. And for as long as this republic has existed, the source of money behind political actors and political voice has been a crucial issue. When our yeah. constitutional republic was founded, we wanted to make sure it didn't come from outsiders because we were terrified of Britain and France and Spain. Now we always want to know where did the money come from and why? That's a key question. It's a key question for every member of Congress and for George Santos. It is a question of a size I haven't seen in quite some time. <laughs> That's right. The scale is different than some of those. By the way, in the chat, just so folks know, Carmen shared a great link to Journalist Resource. 
an excellent source of, of um, uh, you know, all of these studies and research materials and, and what's, you know, going on to understand and probe journalism. Uh, we're going to take questions from the audience in just a few minutes. So add your questions here in the Q&A. But Kathy, Tom, you want to react to this, the, the Santos coverage challenge and all these reporters chasing this freshman congressman down the hall? Is it too much? Is it appropriate? What would you say? Well, where were we before the election? You know, it would have been nice if the voters had known uh, before they cast their ballots. And uh, of course, probably a lot of people in your audience know the story that there was a small Long Island paper that had uh, pretty much had the story. It certainly had enough information to suggest that somebody should be looking into the congressman or the congressman to be. And um, and nobody picked it up. And I think that gets to the problem that Major identified earlier, which is um, hollowed out newsrooms and um, and people chasing the news of the day. I mean, or the, you know, the headline of the day that what I call the big story syndrome, everybody chasing the same story and um, and not digging into like, who is this guy who's running for office to represent us in Congress um, again? I mean, when I started in the newspaper business, we covered state legislative races. We would go and interview the people who were running for state legislature so people would know how to cast an intelligent vote. So I think, you know, this is a resource question, part of it. Um, but now to your story, to your question rather, it's uh, how much, how much, how much resources do we want to put on the Santos story and how much do we wanna put on housing? But again, Santos is clickbait right now. So I think one of the things you're seeing is when newspaper and TV budgets and radio budgets were fatter, you could afford to put more money in stories that weren't going to go viral, <laughs> to use the current term, but you could do both. And now, journalists are faced with a choice. And I've told the students I teach, you're gonna to have to fight to get out from behind that computer. You're gonna to have to fight to go talk to real people. You're gonna to have to fight to cover your beat because resources are stretched and a lot of editors would rather you sit there and rewrite the news of the day. So, you know, whatever, some, curate somebody else's reporting. But reporting is what's important and reporting is what was not done on Santos before the election. So, you know, I think that, you know, if you think about news editors, um, they say no a lot. I um, mean, there are always more potential stories than there's room uh, uh, in uh, whatever you have for news time or space in, in, in print. Um, and I think the power to say no is a, often underestimated. And uh, certainly Santos is a story, but how, how much is too much? I mean, that, that, gets, to be, that gets to be a question. Uh, or we could go back to uh, the 2016 campaign. I have no question that uh, the email story uh, turned the tide and uh, brought us Donald Trump uh, as president of the United States. Uh, and... Uh, you know, that story in the 2016 campaign, we did a study of that, uh, the election coverage, 10 different news outlets. Uh, her emails uh, got twice as much coverage uh, as everything that she said about domestic or foreign policy. Uh, and uh, now we've had similar kind of email uh, development since then, but they kind of don't go anywhere. So I think always this question for the editor is kind of proportionality. Uh, how important is this? How much is too much? Uh, these are difficult decisions. I'm not trying to suggest that they're easy calls. Uh, the same thing about uh, Trump's tweets. Um, uh, yes, I mean, when you when you say this is a presidential statement, uh, then that elevates the importance of the tweets. But that doesn't make every tweet important, right? You still have to discriminate among those that really have true news value and those that are simply kind of titillating and uh, are going to catch the audience's attention. They're going to be kind of fun for journalists to play around with. And, uh, you know, Trump comes back into the arena as a candidate uh, for 2024. Uh, I don't think journalists are obliged uh, to cover everything that he says. Uh, and if he utters an untruth, uh, yeah, if, you, if you're gonna report it, maybe you wanna say this isn't quite factual. Uh, your other option is not to cover it. 
uh, not to give it public attention. Uh, we know what happens uh, when these things get out there. Uh, people use them for their own purposes, and uh, they don't always kind of take it as the truth. They're, the truth as they see it is often what, what someone is saying, even if it is the untruth. So I think this is very difficult terrain. And I'm not I'm not suggesting that it's easy, but uh, I think judgment, uh, you know, it's not like the courts. Uh, it, where's the power of the journalist? Uh, it's in judgment. Uh, that's really the, what gives the uh, the journalist's credibility and uh, builds public trust is to really make judgments that are in the public interest. You know, one of the questions uh, in our in our summary of tonight's discussion uh, was about interpretation. Uh, should there be a new approach that favors more interpretation and not just uh, fact one, fact two, fact three? Would would more interpretation better inform a bombarded public? Uh, where do you how do you react to that, Tom? Um, I think more interpretation is necessary, but again, uh, it can be uh, kind of tricky. Uh, uh, if the journalist is going to do interpretation. Uh, the journalist really has to understand the situation and they have to understand the issue. Uh, if you're simply going to try to give an explanation and you don't know very much, uh, you know, one of the most interesting findings uh, came out um, in a study that, and the question is, uh, who's more likely to think they know a lot? Uh, the person who knows little or the person who knows a lot? And, and it's actually the person who knows a little. Uh, they, they think the world is much simpler than it actually is. So. Um, I think interpretation is invaluable. Uh, I think it's really important to the audience. But, but if you're going to do interpretation, uh, you really have to know what you're talking about. Because if not, you're going to put speculation in there. You're going to put guesses in there. Uh, you're going to become part of the misinformation problem. I think, uh, well, Kathy, before you, let me just have you re uh, react to both Tom and this question. So we're sort of bringing questions from the audience. It says, uh, Aren't the major news outlets already saturated with interpretation? Isn't all interpretation in some way opinion and therefore based on part? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, I think it, it's a really, uh, this is the big dilemma that I think everyone is talking about. And one of the things that's important, and I think you're, uh, audience is uh, probably very aware of this, but I think people who aren't journalists uh, we need to be more educated as to, to how we do wrestle with these issues and, um, and understand that uh, what you get from the New York Times or the Boston Globe or the St. Louis Post-Dispatch or the Columbia Missourian is a very different thing that's been thought through in a way that you know, your crazy Uncle Vinny's Facebook post uh, has not. And uh, the problem is that, you know, Crazy Uncle Vinny and the New York Times are right next to each other on Facebook and they pretty much look alike. Um, the, the, the interpretation, I think it's scary. I, I think what we really need is more reporting because to get to a point that Major made, it's really show, don't tell. You know, don't tell me what to think. Show me, show me. And, um, and, and I think uh, the more reporting we can do and the more facts we can put out in front of people, that, is, that gives people a chance to understand uh, and, and maybe persuade people. It's very difficult now. But I think where the judgment comes in, it's not so much in what I'm gonna utter and how I'm gonna, or what I'm gonna write about what this is said, but it's what stories I choose to cover, what stories my editor chooses to elevate above the fold or put in the A block on the, on the evening news. And that's where I think the, the professional judgment comes in. And we've kind of outsourced that to Chartbeat and Twitter. And I think the more we take that power back, I hope and pray that our audience will recognize it but I do think there's an education component that's going to have to be part of this, educating people as to what journalism is, as opposed to the stuff that you see online, which to use the technical newsroom term that I'm sure the professor uses all the time, uh, crap. And so we've got to really help people distinguish between reported public service journalism that is reported, that's gone to primary sources, that has the facts, and that, by the way, when we make mistakes, we correct, right. um, oppo as opposed to Crazy Uncle Benny's post. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so we need anybody to be persuadable to that to that accurate assessment by Kathy? Well, I thought it's interesting to compare Uncle Benny with the old gray lady. I think it was the uh, reference to the time. So uh, I can I can see those two images differently, but I'm, I'm in full agreement with with uh, with Kathy's argument here. I think, think this gets very much to kind of where we need to be thinking about journalism, and uh, that's partly a transparency issue uh, for journalists uh, uh, to not only. Uh, Talk about what you do well, but to make your audience aware of, uh, of, of, of your vulnerabilities. I mean that um, this is a very difficult task to kind of redo everything every 24 hours. <laughs> do it fast, get it right. Uh, this is a challenge that uh, few institutions are, would be up to. Uh, certainly, scholars are not up to it. So um, there are going to be mistakes made, uh, and. Uh, you know, being honest about those mistakes and about the process by which uh, uh, stories come to be and the selection process. I think all of those things help an audience to understand uh, not only the strengths of the stories that they're encountering, but also kind of alerts them to be a little careful here. Uh, you know, this isn't all gospel and, um, and, and we don't always uh, have the full truth. I think, um, you know, when I talk to audiences, and, you know, I do think people are hungry for guides to help them through this sea of information. That's the good news. And so I think we will see a move back to more curated news. But the, you know, well, the thing people ask me is, how can you tell if it's if it's a reliable source, Brian? And um, the and what I always say is, um, you know, this is going to sound counterintuitive, but do they have corrections? Because to err is human, and we try really, really hard not to make mistakes, but we will because we're human. To err is human, but to correct is professional. And if an, a news organization or a website has corrections, you know a couple of things. You know they're in it for the long haul, that they care about their reputation, and they care about the reputations of the people they cover. And that's really important. And that tells you that they are that they are a reliable source. So I think that kind of education is is something that we have to do more of. We have to kind of pull back the curtain and show people how we do things. And and even though yes, we do make mistakes, we really try hard not to. And there's a campaign that exists to try to destroy the news outlets that are trying their best. Um, and if you if you have to understand, there's a war against those outlets uh, every day. Um, that's my aside. Here's another question I from agree. the audience. Uh, it's about chat GPT. Uh, I, I think AI is on the tips of everyone's tongues right now. So let's add that to the conversation here. The question says, recent coverage of chat GPT paints a new and different world. One imagines a, a speechwriter getting texts from the app and then some reporters generating stories with the app. So how will we know who's actually talking and who's accountable for the words? And how will this affect reporters' employment? Who'd like Wait, to go Professors first? all over are really worried about this one. Let me tell you, we've been having conversations about this. I don't know about Harvard, but we've sure been talking about it at Mizzou. Um, it's, you know, I think uh, AI has always been, because of the, um, the economic problems we've been talking about, there's a lot of talk in the industry about AI as kind of this salvation that, you know, you could do the routine stories. Um, and, you know, a lot of news organizations have experimented with this, uh, routine business news, routine sports stories. Um, and even people have talked about city council votes and that kind of thing, which I think would be a, an enormous, terrible mistake. Uh, but the big news is that um, CNET, uh, the tech sort of consumer uh, magazine news site, uh, tried this and um, they've had to issue a spate of corrections and apologies because not only did the bots make mistakes, but they plagiarized, <laughs> which I guess is no surprise because bots are trained on humans' writing. So um, I think um, I think if there is a use, and I'm not saying there wouldn't be some use for AI uh, in news coverage, um, it has to be transparent. You you have to know. Like the CNET uh, event was a, the, the example is a little bit scandalous because they 
they bylined the stories seen at staff. Well, I guess if you consider the bot a staff member, and I wonder if the bot is getting health insurance, but the, um, that is the, uh, you know, that's I think the key thing is there has to be transparency uh, and, and say, if, you're, if this is a, uh, an AI generated story, you need to say so. Tom, anything to add on the bold future of AI? It's simply going to get more and more sophisticated. I think it's going to get harder and harder. Mm -hmm. um, you know, right now, um, you could probably do news story light uh, with what's available um, and uh, very simple stories of the kind that uh, Kathy is talking about. Uh, the When you talk, though, Brian, or you asked earlier about do we need more interpretation? Uh, and kind of deeper analysis. Uh, you know, this uh, software isn't up to that yet, uh, but there's gonna be a point where it is. Uh, so um, I think that's, and I haven't thought enough about how we're gonna think about this when we reach that point. And uh, it's not only gonna be words, uh, it's gonna be images and the ability to alter images and transform. Uh, Tom, you're muted. I think well, he did tell us that he's having uh, yeah, some a little hiccup on Tom's feed. So he'll come we'll, back. We'll, we'll get it back. Yeah. But you know, I, I think we have to think about it the following way: uh, everything on the internet is going to be robot generated. So can we create a space on that internet for real human words? Like I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think in metaphors like a castle and a moat. And uh, by all means, it's fun to go outside the castle and go see what the robots are doing today but I'm going to want to know that I'm inside the castle walls when I'm reading the Boston Globe and the New York Times. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking in that metaphorical language, like I'm, you know, we're going to get to the point where everything is written by, by robots. So how can we have a, some confidence of what's written by humans? Um, that's where my head's at about well, it. The, the hopeful sign is, you know, I talk to uh, students all the time yeah. and analog is in, you know, so I think, <laughs> Um, uh, uh, students are what does uh, that mean? younger generation, I think may, and, and what the interesting thing about uh, my students is um, they are, they do not have a lot of social media. This isn't to say they don't have addiction problems, but they are aware of that. Um, but they are de definitely minimizing their social media profile and being choosy about this. And it's an indication to me that there may be some backlash developing. So we'll see what happens. Um, uh, you know, I may be being Pollyanna, but I definitely sense that among the, the younger people I talk to. Well, and Tom, isn't it the, isn't it the reality that folks who want higher quality human made news and are willing to pay for it, you know, they will be able to seek that out. The, the challenge is that broader environment where there's a whole lot of garbage that everyone has to sort through. Well, there was an interesting study that was done at the Shorenstein Center some years ago about the value of news, um, uh, trying to put an economic value on it. And uh, the conclusion was it's close to zero. Uh, and the reason for that is not that it is invaluable or, or not valuable, but um, for most people, uh, there are substitutes. So uh, if you have a very good newspaper and you have to pay uh, a certain amount of money uh, to, uh, to subscribe to that newspaper uh, and uh, there's a less good alternative that's free, uh, most people will choose the less good alternative. Um, and uh, you know, that's increasingly a problem uh, as uh, you know, news outlets are, are really strapped for, uh, for cash. The business model isn't working very well. They're trying to kind of raise money through subscriber fees and the like, uh, you know, um, quality journalism costs money. Uh, there's no question about that. It can't be done on the cheap, uh, but uh, sloppy journalism. Uh, and, and, and maybe you can get uh, AI to do half of your, uh, half of your copy, but uh, there are ways to do this on the cheap, but uh, you're not getting a very good uh, product out of it. But the point is for many people, uh, that's enough. Uh, they're, they don't discriminate between uh, really high quality journalism and, and uh, 
quite mediocre journalism. Right, and we have to be realistic about that that state of play. Uh, a couple more questions from our audience. Dan Frumkin uh, with this one. He says, why is the widespread and quite coherent critique of modern political journalism? He's talking about the critique that says, stop with the both sidesism, that sort of thing. He says, why is this critique so soundly rejected by corporate media? He says it should start with calling out the lies with as much passion as Fox spreads the lies. I wish I could ask Major from CBS. I think we lost his internet connection. Tom, do you think there is a rejection of the, I mean, there is a very, I mean, you're part of it, a prominent critique of, of, uh, of political journalism about both sides and all that. Why has it been, do you feel it's been rejected by corporate outlets? I, I think the, I think journalists have been moving away from um, kind of both sidesism, and uh, uh, they're more conscious of the problems that attend it. Uh, I think there's still a lot of false equivalencies that you find uh, in the news. Uh, that's that's a kind of a subtler kind of both sidesism, uh, but increasingly I think there's some awareness that uh, that doesn't work uh, because again that shifts the question of uh, who's telling the truth to the audience and uh, and. And we know that uh, there are some problems in, in shifting that responsibility. I mean, you know, if, if journalists are going to be the guardians of the truth uh, and are going to be, for many of us, kind of uh, really the beacon that we, we look to, uh, to really get an honest appraisal of what's going on, uh, then I think journalists are going to have to kind of step up and rethink a little bit what they've been doing over time. And that includes then you have to call out the lie. Uh, but again, sometimes the best thing to do is to ignore it, uh, because simply giving it uh, time and space, uh, that will get it going. That often is enough to, uh, to get it out there and to be believed by men. It's a very difficult situation, I think, in terms of how journalists navigate uh, what is increasingly this, uh, uh, you know, there once was a very strong norm uh, if you were in politics against the line and uh, the voters punished it. Uh, but uh, we've lost that sanction. Uh, voters seem, uh, when their side does it, they seem to relish it. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's really uh, dropped the guardrails around this. And so who's left? Uh, uh, we depend on the other party uh, to call those things out, but uh, audiences see that as biased. Uh, so uh, who are you going to turn to? Uh, you've got to turn to the journalists. So I think they have to figure this out and uh, do it in a way that convinces the audience uh, that they're neutral. Uh, they call this out uh, on a fair basis on when both sides do it. Uh, and they call out certain things and not others. Uh, you know, and I think, for example, uh, threats to democracy, uh, those require a, a larger sounding, uh, sounding alarm than uh, some of these things that surround uh, policy issues where you have actually value, different values at stake. And, uh, you know, if you start joining those debates, uh, then you got problems. I think, yeah, I can't quite hear you, uh, Brian. I feel like, do we? Do you have this audio, Tom? I'm sorry, I was That's muted. Okay, I got what you. a rookie! I got it's been you. three I years on Zoom. What am I doing? Still so muting by accident. Uh, here's a counter argument of sorts from Denise Ordway. She's a she was a local reporter covering local state government for 15 years. She says, "Why should journalists get to filter what the public hears and sees, or offer subjective interpretations, considering that many journalists are white and come from middle or higher income families? They don't represent or have the same life experience." as a significant share of the US public. Kathy, you want to react to that? Well, I think I think you know that that's sort of the repose to to Dan's point. It isn't that he doesn't have a valid point. Um, but so does Ms. Ordway. I mean, it, it's uh, and this is the this is what people are really uh, we're really having trouble with this that um, yes, it's important to call out uh, lies. And to quote my former colleague, Jill Lawrence from USA Today, in one of our election postmortems, um, she said, balanced isn't always fair. And oftentimes, uh, you know, we, it, there is this knee-jerk tendency. I think Dan is right about that, but to say, oh, well, if that guy made three mistakes, did we get three mistakes on the other side in the debate? Um, and part of that, is again, it goes back to this economic problem, in my opinion, of news organizations being financially insecure. And I don't know, do we wanna make those readers mad? Do we wanna lose those, uh, those viewers? 
And so I think um, it's this, there is an insecurity in the business right now for financial reasons that I think has cost people some of the courage uh, that we should have. And, um, and then when you don't have the support of even your audience, you know, the audience, it, it, reporters are under attack and, and, and in terrible ways. And, and social media has become a vector for that attack. And particularly, uh, for women and journalists of color. So I, I think, and you know, the, the, the question that we all have to ask ourselves is to what degree are we self-censoring because of that? Um, but this is a big issue. You know, I'm a, I, I hold the chair in free press studies here. And, um, you know, Maria Ressa was the canary down the mine shaft. So I, I think we, we, when I say we, I don't mean we journalists, I mean we Americans, we people who love democracy um, need to figure out ways that we can address this problem in a, in a holistic way in our society. I think education is a really big component of it. Um, but, uh, but I also think um, that, that the idea of being neutral um, or trying to be neutral, being fair, being fair, and that's different from being neutral, but being fair is a really important thing. And some of the most rewarding conversations I've ever had are with people I don't agree with. Um, and I've had to have those conversations because as a reporter, I was obliged to have those conversations with people. Right. And I worry that my students won't do that mm. because the the, the atmosphere is so toxic. We had students go to a campaign event at this year and have a person at this campaign event come up and tell these two Asian students to go back to China. They're student journalists. It's really a scary time. And I think it's more than a journalism problem. That's a great I mean, way to say it. so much more, so much more than that journalism problem. Uh, Tom, how would you react? Oh, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I just echo some of, uh, you know, Kathy's thoughts. Uh, you know, the composition of the newsroom uh, affects the selections in terms of what stories get covered, uh, from what angle and the like. And, uh, you know, the underrepresentation of women, uh, people of color in the newsrooms, uh, that has affected. Uh, you know what the what what gets out to the public. Uh, I might also say that um, we probably have too few conservatives <laughs> and Republicans uh, in the newsroom, um, and uh, you know the uh, certain aspects of the uh, of American society uh, that uh, are associated with the right uh, don't get as much coverage because we don't have a lot of conservatives and Republicans in our newsroom. So. I, I do think that that demographic balance is very important around the selection process. So, you know, which events are going to make news and the like, and uh, uh, and but you know, journalists have been struggling this with, with for this with several decades, and uh, there's some really deep deep rooted problems here in terms of why the recruitment hasn't gone as well as it should. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, one that's not talked about very much uh, is journalism is not a very high paying job, uh, and. Uh, there are sometimes more attractive alternatives out there for young people. Well, fit, so just to add on to your point, Tom, 50% uh, as of like 2018, it's probably worse now, but something like 50% of American journalists, this was a statistic put together by uh, Columbia Journalism Review, 50% of American journalists live in five major cities. Mm -hmm. And we wonder why we missed uh, you know, the Electoral College gives disproportionate power to rural America, and we're not covering it. And we don't have enough rural or small town reporters in our newsrooms either. You know, there was an article in Journalist Resource about a study that showed um, not uh, hyper partisan outlets, outlets that are extremely biased. They use shorter sentences, they use less formal language than straight, nonpartisan, serious outlets. And it got me thinking about the way that we produce news assuming everyone knows the background and assuming everyone knows the fancy words that we use. And I, I do wonder if that's another layer to add. I mean, you know, we're talking about whether the shoes still fits, like 
Maybe we need to design different shoes. Maybe we should be writing stories that start at the beginning and not in the middle. Uh, so that when Kevin McCarthy loses the 10th vote of 15, you know, that you can understand why it's happened. And look, I don't want to just, you know, I do think outlets of the New York Times do try to do some of that. But I wonder if that's another added, you know, element here about making sure we're not leaving people behind in the way that we cover the news. Yeah, I think it's a form of elitism, you know, when we assume that everybody uh, has this insider knowledge. And, um, and so I think um, uh, what we, tr what we do when I one of the things I tell my students is, um, you need to be that kid who says, why does the emperor have no clothes? You need to be that annoying child who says, why, why, why? And what is that? What does that mean? Uh, what does that acronym mean? What is it? Because I said, people will throw jargon at you, um, hoping that they can snow you. And if you come into me as the editor and I say, what does it mean? And you can't tell me, you have not done your reporting. So uh, we are, in, we need to be translators and we need to, um, it's, it, but it's an art, you know, you need to understand and become something of an expert, but then you need to have that beginner's mind that uh, the Buddhists talk about and go back to sort of unpack that for people who don't know as much as you do. Uh, but it is, it is an art and um, increasingly a lost art, but I think it's really important to um, keep emphasizing that at our journalism schools. And I want to call out, there's a comment from Tom Gardner here, and I totally agree with it. He says he's uh, chairing a communication department and how um, encouraged he is that young people still want to be journalists, despite everything we've talked about. And that is my experience too. Young mm -hmm. people want to do this work, even though it is badly paid, because this is public service and it is so great that despite the fact people are saying nasty things to them, like I told you about our students experiencing and despite the, the not very remunerative pay that they wanna be eyewitnesses to history and they, want, they still yeah. want to be in this profession. And that is a hopeful sign too. Well, since it is uh, both the end of our time here and the start of a new semester, what, what's one thing you, you all tell your students, uh, tell your classes about why they should go try to be this change? What should they do differently? Let's wrap on that for each of you, if you don't mind. Tom, you wanna go first? I, I simply talk to them about being change makers, uh, that, um, you know, that, that they're not here and they're not getting this kind of education uh, just for their own good. Uh, uh, that, one of the responsibilities that go with having the privilege of being a college graduate uh, or working at the graduate level uh, is to give back. Uh, you've got to be thinking outside yourself, uh, what you can do uh, to strengthen your community uh, and uh, who in that community uh, can really benefit from, from what you can uh, contribute. So uh, to think large, in other words, and to think outside yourself, uh, to think in terms of community and not not simply and now when you carry a lot of debt coming out from college that could be a little tough sometimes but uh i think to uh, to have that kind of mindset i think it's extraordinarily valuable i tell my students um you know that it's all of those things that tom said but it's also the most legal fun you can have that um, it's an, a license to ask questions, a license to find out about interesting people, to find out about anything you're interested in. And I tell them, we talk about all the things we talked about here and I challenge them. I say, this is your moonshot. This is your generation's moonshot. We have to figure out a way to make public service journalism pay again because if we don't, we won't have a democracy. So we're giving you the keys to the car and uh, <laughs> drive it well. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, it's a, an incredible car to drive. Uh, Kathy, thank you so much, Tom. Thank you so much. Brian, it's been thank an honor you. talking with both of you. Uh, let's thank our sponsors. <laughs> 
<laughs> the, the Harvard Kennedy School, New England Alumni Association, and the Shorenstein Center at Media, Politics, and Public Policy. Thank you to Caroline and Liz uh, for making this possible here on Zoom. Uh, and thank you all for your questions and commentary. Uh, it's been fun reading the chat with all of you. Thanks, for everybody, for joining. And have a great night. Thanks, Brian. Thank Thanks, you. Brian. Nice being on with you, Kathy. Thanks, likewise. Yeah.